Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 8 of Night Call. It's been a while, but I was sick and my voice sounded very strange, so I had to take a break. But now I'm back and I hope that I sound normal again. And I hope that I remember everything, but I think that to me it was pretty clear the last time, or it felt pretty clear, that our main suspect now is the retired policeman. But let's just continue. Oh yeah, we have some reports to read, I forgot. Hmm. Well then, we can take a look into these as well. You open your front door and your foot hits something. An envelope. Someone slid it under the door, Pousset. You open it straight away. It's a police file. He laid on the table. It must be from your passenger, the whistleblower. He smiled. He kept his word. Wait, what? More? You take a few minutes to update your board with your new clues. A bus goes by, making the walls shake. It's time to get moving on your investigation. Wait, we got even more info now? Nice. Well, then let's take a look. Okay, so... Last evening, before we left to work, we got a call that said that Claudia Campos wasn't um, a suspect anymore because she seemed to have an alibi. And because of the wrinkled hands, I think that we, uh, or at least I did, that I suspected one of them. Because these guys are young. Oh, wait, that is new, I think. Heard in your taxi, victim ki two killed an Algerian man, never arrested. Okay, so it seems like that was... That's connected to him somehow? Hmm... It is really hard to find the new... The new evidence, or sorry, the new infos. Even though I ordered the board last time. It's kind of hard to, to realize what's, what the new messages are. But I think the stack here should be my stuff. Is that the new one? Pierrot's dad worked on the Richtonen scandal. I think it aligns to down here pretty well, so it could have been me who put it there. Victim 4 responsible for Richtonen scandal never trialed. Okay, well, I, I definitely don't know. <laughs> so, oh, well, wait a second. So we have the police reports for victim 3 and for victim 1. My idea would be to see if anyone could be... Killer had wrinkles on his hands, so I guess that could only be him now. Okay, so there is no, not really one particular victim that could be, that, that would lead to him. Which could also be seen as suspicious now. Okay, so... Maybe... Let's just start... Oh wait, we can read both of them now. We have enough time. Okay. So again, I have no idea where our new... Oh wait, killer fought with victim number one. Okay, so who was victim number one? He was protected by the mayor. That's kind of all we know about him, right? Message on crime scene one, justice. Killer fought with victim three as well. We know, we don't really know anything about victim number three, do we? Like, who he was. Okay, victim number four was the Richtoden scandal. Victim number two is a fierce politician. Victim number one was protected. Oh wait, victim number two killed an Algerian man and was never arrested, and that was the same as the fierce politician. Well, that doesn't really give us any new clues, I say, I'd say. Hmm. Okay, well then I'll just end the night. My biggest suspect is still the, the retired police officer. With a heavy hand, you wipe your tired face. You lie down on the open sofa bed. The events of the day run through your head. The streets, the passengers, their faces, their problems. Your brain is running at full speed, your body aches and you're in pain. You can tell you need to get more sleep. You glance at your investigation board. Your hands are shaking, you don't quite know what's happening around you anymore. For a short moment, the room around you starts to flutter. 
shake your head and your mind wanders for a second. A second later, you're asleep. You open one eye. Someone flushes the toilet and you hear the pipes shake. One of them runs under your bed. You find the sound calming. You get up quickly. And a few minutes later, you're outside of your studio. Okay, wasn't it about seven nights that we have time? Hmm. We have one guy to transport, but on the other hand, I would like to tank. But I also need to... No, I need to go there first. I need to answer some questions. You park your taxi across from the stadium just a few meters from a two-story building. Okay, what are we doing there? It's an odd brick place that clashes with the huge concrete behemoth that is Charlotte Stadium. You get out of the car and walk to the front door. You knock. You wait a few minutes, light comes on, and the door finally opens. Marco appears. Marco is a former taxi driver, a strange guy, a bit spacey and different. He's been working at the stadium for a few years now. Well, shit, you're still alive? That's Marco. You like him. I mean, wow. So nice to see you. Even though he stole your wife. Oh. Come in, come in. You want something to drink? All right, you stop drinking. A cup of coffee? Yeah, why not? You follow him into his caretaker's home. It's pretty nice, despite the mess and filth. He serves you a cup of coffee and sits down at the table. You follow suit. The only noise in the room is the TV behind Marco. Before you came by, he was playing a soccer video game. The fans are singing and clapping their hands. So, what you've been up to? I have some questions for you. Let's, let's get straight to the point. He shakes his head. No, no, not yet. Man, seriously, no. The last time I helped you out, I lost my job, so the answer is no. Well, apparently you stole our wife, so... Hmm. You have no choice and you know it. You owe me this much. Marco drops his head between his shoulders. He starts to beg. I'm telling you, man, I love this job. It's so easy. I get to take care of a stadium that's empty 75% of time. He sits up roughly in his chair. Behind him on the screen, the stadium is going wild. I need information on Ronan Besson. He straightens up. Ronan, the coach that got killed by the judge? The very one. He was a great guy. Everyone's torn up about it. But... There were rumors. Some parents heard he was a little too hands-on with the kids a while back, if you get my drift. No one ever looked into it. Was it true? I don't know nothing. He sighs. A few months ago, Ronan cornered a kid, like, by the showers. You know what I mean? The kid stabbed him in the thigh with a pair of scissors and went away. Whoa. Who has a pair of scissors in the shower? The kid's parents weren't sure whether they'd file a complaint. The club director brought Ronan in and bam, two days later, he was murdered. Who else knows this? But the kid? No one, I think. Well, maybe some other parents? Don't know. You get up. One last thing. Uh, let's just say thank you. Don't tell anyone where you got this information, okay? Don't worry. Oh, well, come on. We won't be mean. I won't sip your coffee in silence. Don't worry. Yeah, I've heard that before. A vuvuzela noise comes from the TV. Okay, I've got to run. He walks you to the door, mumbling with clenched teeth. Every time I run into you, you jinx me. Every single time. You walk outside and over to your taxi. Door key, motor purring, you go back to work. Oh well. I mean, that didn't take up a lot of time, but... Hmm. I think I'm gonna go here. So, what to do with this information right now? I mean, this does sound like a par a pa some parent or something could have done it. Or maybe the old police guy is the grandfather of the, guy, of the boy, or who knows. 
Okay, I'm just gonna go there and then we're gonna go fill up our tank and then... Familiar smell tickles your nose. Oh, the boy. You turn around just in time to see a little ghost appear on the back seat of your taxi. He remains still as he watches you. How nice to see you again. Let us not waste any time, if you'd be so kind. No, I don't want to drive you anywhere. Come on, I need wanted to go up there. Ah. An electric charge runs through your body. You start driving. Rue de Rossier, please. You stare at the rearview mirror. What for? We're going to Rue de Rossier to eat. Falafel. The delicious smell tickles your nose. Hmm, that sounds good. The little ghost heaves a short sigh. He seems happy. Your stomach starts to growl. You're hungry. Strange. Usually, you never fall victim to the night munchies. Your colleagues often gain weight when they work the night shift. Nothing to do but snack. Tonight, however, you're famished. We're going to the Rue de Rossiers to eat the best falafel in Paris. I love walking around there, drinking in the smells, hearing the hiss of fried food, seeing juices and sauces dripping off the sandwiches. He's almost giddy. Oglers who twist every which way to catch a piece of tomato about to fall. His silhouette blurs. I wish I could taste it all. The rear window lowers all by itself. A gust of icy cold wind fills the cab. You close the window as quickly as possible. Behind you, the little ghost's voice starts to break up, scatter. I can just imagine, but it's not the same. It's just not like the real thing. No, not at all. The same. He seems far off, about to disappear. Everything all right? He doesn't answer your question and becomes vague and hesitant. They're screaming, shouting, throwing themselves to the ground. A bomb goes off. Another. Same. He catches his breath, looks outside, points at something in the distance. There, Rue de Rossier. Paris stopped here. The city wall on which so many children played hide and seek no longer exists. I never even climbed up there. Now the stones are hidden in other buildings. And no one will ever find them again. Such is the life of a city. He grows silent for a moment, a nauseating smell takes over the cab. It takes you a few seconds to recognize it. Gunpowder. Rue de Rossiers, Bitter Street. How many people thought they were at home there before leaving to grow old elsewhere? There was a terrorist attack. Right here. Six dead. Right in the middle of lunch. Plates were being passed, bottles being poured, forks falling on the floor. The child in the, black blur in the back blurs, becomes distant. I can imagine the last sentence they pronounced, their last words. No, no, don't worry about it. Yes, yes, I can give you something else instead, two coffees. Coffees. When he starts to speak again, his voice has a broken quality. As if there were a far off threatening figure walking towards the car. I'd like to drink coffee. I didn't even know it existed before, when I was still alive, breathing, walking. His figure flutters. What about you? Do you like coffee? You can tell this is not just a simple question. The child smiles at you. Tell me about coffee. It tastes, its texture, its warmth. Tell me everything. Let's talk about coffee then. Coffee is a drug, a hard one. It screws with your stomach. Reminds you you're really just a machine inside. Tubes, pockets, filters. It burns your throat and stomach. Why do you drink it then? I don't know. I think that sums up who we are, doesn't it? You glance back at the kid. He's listening in silence. So, you don't like it? Oh no, I do. But it's like cigarettes, a slow killer. No matter the quality of the beans or the tobacco, it's poison. A memory floats through your head, a heavy set figure rolling a cigarette between his worn figures. 
We are complicated beasts. Yes, we like to mistreat ourselves. Like what happened in the Rue de Rossier. Suddenly he's gone. You break sharply, keeping an eye on the rearview mirror. You're now alone in the taxi. Alone and craving falafel. <laughs> that is not what I was planning to do. I wanted to go up there and now I'm here. Ah. <sighs> that makes me unhappy. He also didn't pay. Hmm. Also, I'm pretty far away from every gas station there is. Then um, we don't know him. Let's pick him up. Where is he going? Oh well, at least he pays. Francois de la Nerie. You immediately recognize the next passenger getting in your taxi. Ooh, this is a celebrity. You never watch television, rarely listen to the radio, you don't read the newspaper, and yet... You know Francois de la Nerie's face. Polemicist, novelist, columnist, politician too, you think. Your passenger distractedly gives you his address. You start driving. He appears to be out of breath, his voice and hands are shaking. Unbelievable. He separates each syllable as if it's going to protect him from the violence around him. Unbelievable. Is everything okay? Can you even begin to fathom what a public danger this represents? What? A mere five minutes ago, I wanted to cross the street. Suddenly, slicing through the darkness, a deafening silence came in. Electric car. Its asphalt-coated tires drove right over the tip of my loafer. It's shot, I can tell. The leather is compressed and streaked with mud and suit. It's a travesty. A travesty. He begins writing furiously. You catch a few words from time to time. What for? For the environment? Create more road thefts? Save polar bears? <laughs> he leaves you hanging for a second before grinning. Another badly thought out stunt from the snowflake hipster lobby. Kinoa. <laughs> I wouldn't compare electric cars with Kinoa, but okay. Electric planes that will crash into Charles de Gaulle airport without a sound. You hear a throaty laugh. The earth? Safe, intact, clean, but at what cost? No way, Jose. Well, I don't know. Having a run over shoe isn't that bad when you can save the world, right? I'd say. Our planet produces oil, so we must use it. It would be unnatural not to. Unnatural indeed. He chuckles crudely. Rise up in defense of the sweet purr of the convertible, just as they would the hoot of the owl in danger of extinction in the lush forest of the Champagne region. A murderer, assassin, the ferocious silence made to oppress us. He puts down his notebook. A wolfish grin spreads across his face. Yes, magnificent editorial, just magnificent. What about you? Would you want to have a silent car? I would like to have an, an electric car. Yes. Why on God's green earth? <laughs> it makes less noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to run over people without them hearing. It's better for the environment. Better for the environment? Come now, what is environmentally friendly about a weapon of mass destruction? These cars are going to kill hundreds, thousands of people. Their silence will be the carbon dioxide of the 21st century. Well, that's a little bit of a stretch. They will infiltrate our cities, our countryside. They'll mow us down on foot, on bike, even in another car. I'll tell it as I see it. Noise is life. A city without noise is not a city. Mark my words. Well, there is enough noise without cars. You drive in silence for a few minutes. In the back seat, the polemicist is fuming and you catch occasional snippets of nonsense. The taxi has almost reached your passenger's place. It's just here. You pull up in front of his address and build an old building, freshly renovated. That must have made a lot of noise too, the renovation. On the top floor, the bay windows shine faintly in the darkness as the Eiffel Tower's spotlight washes over them. Your passenger sighs. Oh, the devils. The fools. 
It's the middle of the night and they're still having the time of their lives. He opens the window on his side and screams at a packed cafe. <laughs> the heated patio is filled with young people well dressed and quite drunk. When will you cease this madness? Then turns to you to whisper, as if in secret. Every night I make one hell of a racket, impossible to get a wink of sleep. Oh, you don't like the noise, huh? He pays, gets out of the car and is in front of the bar in three angry leaps. You can hear his voice from far away, a few words and some outdated swearing with the whiff of senility. <laughs> what a strange figure. You stop listening and drive off. Well, he tipped kind of okay. Thanks. So where is the next gas station at? Oh, I guess that's RV. I think I really need to go to the gas station now. And then we can visit our hotspots or whatever. We pull over and stop at a gas station. Yes, not a soul in sight. Fluorescent lights irritate your eyes and the smell of pee is wafting up from the space in between the pumps. Ew! It's self-service here, you pay directly at the pump. The mini-mart over there, it must sell newspapers. The person behind the counter must see and hear things, might be worth asking a couple questions. This place makes you nervous, all you want is to get back into your warm cab. Okay, well then let's fill the tank. Maybe half or something. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, well then, maybe we can ask him something. You walk into the mini-mart. The clerk behind the counter is undoubtedly the most ordinary person you've ever seen. Yes. Talk with him. Let's talk with him. The serial killer business is crazy. The clerk cuts you off, pointing an angry finger at the newspapers on display in front of him. Have you seen how much the police suck at catching him? You smile and let him keep talking. Ooh. So I wonder, I mean, if we buy a lottery ticket, will it give us a little bit of money? Yeah, but I don't know. We would need a lot of money. Have a good evening. The cold welcomes you outside and quickly makes you forget the clerk's unpleasant tone. Yeah, so let's leave. You get into your taxi and drive away. Okay, so it seems like a lot of people are in this area around here. Hey, she's hiding. Uh, yeah, there. There. And slowly. Ah, damn it. Ah, there it was. Okay, we're going there. Her face looks familiar too. Have we driven her before? What what the hell was that? Why wasn't there anything? I, did I click something? No, I didn't. What the hell? Okay. Okay, you're closest to one. I hope you give a lot of money then. I have no idea what that was. So was it like obsolete or something? Okay. Well then, Carlo Ceruti, let's go. The passenger getting into your taxi is drunk. Oh, great. He all but trips as he's getting into the back seat, leaving a piece of his jacket stuck in the door as he slams it ten times too hard. The whole street must have heard it. He tries to keep his calm as he gives you his address. Just, you start driving, but keep an eye on him, you never know. His head lolls, his eyes roll, he rummages through his pockets, looking for his phone. In vain. Hey, buddy, tell me, any chance you've seen my phone? Um, no. He looks around. What an idiot, I lost it earlier. Not here, at the bar. He starts mumbling. Or somewhere. 
His eyes start to look like slits. Or at the bar. He's silent for a minute, trying to remember something. When he starts speaking again, he moans. She's gonna kill me. You turn a corner and he slides towards the door, hitting the window hard. Oh fuck, that hurts. Seriously, man. You okay? Yeah, no. See, my wife... She told me not to come home too late. Made me swear across my heart the whole nine yards. She's just had a baby. He corrects himself. We just had a baby, but you know, she's the one who carried it. We didn't find it in the streets or anything. <laughs> I wouldn't have assumed that. He smirks as he imagines that scenario. It's the cutest little baby. I'm so done spending my nights wiping its ass. So when my colleagues invited me out, he hiccups. Well, I mean, I said okay, like I went with them, right? He shakes his head, disgusted. You gotta help me. I have to prepare an an alibi. An alibi? He nods, sure of himself. Yeah, an alibi, an explanation for who I was tonight and what I did. So she doesn't beat the shit out of me. He pauses. Dude, I'm serious, you gotta help me. Shall we accept or shall we refuse? I mean, it was wrong to lie to your wife and it's wrong to leave her alone with the baby. I mean, she needs a break too, I'm pretty sure. But on the other hand, I mean, we have our strange compendium to fill, so we're going to miss out on a lot if we don't accept. Okay. Very well. Seriously? He bursts out laughing and attempts to clap his hands together, but misses. <laughs> Holy shit, awesome. Okay, first we need to start with... Yeah, with... He blanks out and his eyes close. <laughs> hey, wake up. We need something. We need to do something. Hey. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. The main question in this case is, why didn't I call my wife? That's why we need to begin. What about a work emergency? I work in the movie business for a production company. She'd never buy it. Once again, his eyes start to close, his eyelids look like they weigh a ton, his voice sounds perfectly sincere. P five years of higher education, 250 page thesis on a Soviet film director. Now I take care of filming permits for Hollywood mega blockbusters. He sighs. There are no work emergencies, nothing I do matters. He pauses, he appears to have fallen asleep, but asks. Why didn't I call my wife? You tried but couldn't reach her, it's such a blatant lie, so... Yeah, you lost- I mean, you lost your phone, it's the truth, you didn't have your phone. Yeah, but I lost it after I... Your passenger opens his eyes and squeals like a child. That's it, that's it! She doesn't have to know I lost it AFTER putting back a few. <laughs> you, my friend, are a genius. He claps his hands together. Okay, all right, so how'd I lose my phone? <laughs> Dropped it in the toilet. <laughs> stolen. I guess stolen would probably be the best. I mean, I feel bad doing this. It's, I mean, we're just constructing a huge lie for him to tell his wife, his poor wife who just gave birth to a child, but okay, um, forgot to charge it wouldn't really explain why he doesn't have his phone at all. I mean, you just throw your phone away when it's empty. So let's just go with stolen. He looks at you for a second and claps his hands together. Yeah, I got my phone stolen. Like, I left it on the table at lunch and bam, gone. It's already happened to her, so she get can so she can't get on my case about it. <laughs> oh great, he chuckles. Uh, okay, we're good on the phone, but I still need to explain why I didn't call. I mean, she knows I know her number. I'm not sleeping. I, I swear, I'm thinking. He opens his mouth. A little burp escapes. <laughs> Ew. 
I've got to explain why I went out with my colleagues and couldn't call her. He opens his eyes and suddenly recognizes the street. Oh fuck, we're almost there. Shit, quick, quick. Uh, I know. Something happened to me at the bar. That way she'll get that it wasn't my fault, right? That I had no choice. Oh, shit, I got it. He glowed, drooling a bit. I ran into someone I knew in the bar and I we had a few drinks. It was crazy, dear, just crazy. But but who? A long lost friend? He's immediately convinced. Perfect, great, I know exactly exactly who to choose. Damien. He shakes his head quickly. I know Damien's works in marketing. Um, Daniel! An old college friend. Haven't seen him in years. I think he became a dento... dentomologist? Uh, like... The Tick, Spider-Man, Ant-Man? <laughs> what? He became a superhero? Entomologist? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Entomologist. Yeah, I'll tell her I ran into Dam... Daniel, and then we spend the evening just talking that he's a really good friend and all. She'll be down with that. She's always telling me my friends are luscious, but Daniel, he's the real thing. And he's trying to save endangered species. My wife will totally get into that. Okay, so we're good. I have my excuse for the phone. I have my excuse for being busy all evening. Now I just need an excuse for staying out so late. That's not enough. No, dude, not at all. I need something more solid, you know? Something that pulls the lie together, man. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Lying to your wife is like a magic trick. You can't just saw the lady in half. You have to turn the box around, too. I mean, the lady's got to think it's funny, like, LOL, hilarious. I'm cut in half and I can still shake my feet. His eyelids drop. Oh, wow. I wouldn't trust this guy to saw me in half now. <laughs> Neil Strong finale. Something like... Like, well, something, you know? He looks like he's asleep. <laughs> Your driver needed someone to talk to. An old lady who got mocked. Well, no, that sounds so cheap. Some weird guy started following you. And I don't know. Your driver needed someone to talk to. Let's just go with that. Who knows? He opens his eyes wide. Huh? Uh, yeah, you helped out a taxi driver. How? He had some troubles and needed to talk about it. He stares at you. You often unload about your problems to your passengers? You hold his gaze. No. He hesitates and mumbles a few words before speaking up again. I might be able to... Yeah, the taxi driver told me about the screenplay he'd written. You often have people tell you about the screenplay they've written? All the time. <laughs> Even though it's not my job. Since I work in the movie industry, people always tell me. His face lights up. Dude, you're sly. That's perfect, actually. He leans against the door and puts on a soft voice, all ready to charm his wife. Got in a cab. Made a small talk with the driver and well... He started telling me about the screenplay he's writing. He actually sounded really good, like the kind of thing that could help me get a promotion, you see. He pauses. Yeah, that's good. His voice lags, sounds far away. We sat in front of the building for a few minutes. He told me about his life. What a life. He claps. You hear that, man? You hear what a kick-ass screenwriter I'd make? My wife will give me the fucking palm door for my performance. He imitates the sound of a screaming crowd. <laughs> <Wah>! <laughs> and the palm door was awarded to Carlo Ceruti for a lie he invented with a super nice taxi driver. Yep, please mention me. In your speech. He lowers his voice a bit, turning into a TV anchor. 
This is Carlo's 10th sip this year, but it is without a doubt the finest, near perfection. She'll eat it right up, like a child's play. He slaps his thigh. Shall we stop him? Shall we just say nothing? I mean, it's so mean. This is not the right thing to do, and I know it, obviously, but... I wanted to fill up my compendium, and I guess if I just said no from the start, it would just like... It would have been a really quick drive, so we would have missed out on a lot. Shall we stop him now? Just say nothing. All begins with a moving opening scene on that's already reached cult status. The main character's phone is stolen when he leaves at an outdoor table at a bistro. Ah, that kind of terrible mistake most Parisians usually never make. With no way to reach his wife, he normally would have gone straight home. But alas, he was yet unaware what an amazing encounter the evening would hold. He raises three fingers. The kind of encounter you only have three times in a lifetime. Daniel. Your passenger puts on a very serious expression. Yeah, you remember him. An old friend who became an entomologist. Your passenger smirks and seems happy. Oh, how an evening can fly by when you're making up for lost time. When the main character notices the time, it's already very late. Too late. During the taxi ride home, of course, the driver starts talking about a screenplay he's writing. The plot sounds fascinating, and our main character believes he may have a future success on his hands. So they talk, chat, he listens to what the driver has to say. A wink. They get along amazingly well. He switches back to his regular voice. You know my friend is really not bad. I think she'll go for it. He bursts out laughing. Plus this kind of stuff actually always happens to me. <laughs> he taps you on the shoulder. You've always reached a destination. The smug smile on your passenger's face annoys you. You park in front of his place. Don't do this to your wife. Yeah, thanks. She deserves better. He watches you with a smirk on his face. Hilarious. Like it didn't bother you until now? Oh no. He hands you a bill. Keep the change, buddy. I should have said no! Ah. I just, I just, I was so afraid that it would just like skip everything and... Uh, he slaps you on the shoulder and gets out of the taxi. You watch him stagger a bit as he walks away. He disappears into his building. You drive away. You didn't even tip me well. Oh, thanks, jerk. We. She does seem so familiar. I want to see her. Ooh, she goes a long way. Ah, oh, I know. I see. Yes, we know her. Those are the two, um, the couple who wanted to, who are looking for a donor for a child. Okay, I see. Well, we're gonna drive them in the next episode, so thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.